Okay, so hi everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Pronto, and um, I'm going to be giving an overview of the methodology of using scenario planning and also touch um, briefly on how we've applied this exercise to um, dealing with climate change in New York and the impacts to the dairy industry. So I thought um, just really briefly I'd give a little introduction to what combines the three of us here today, still David and myself. We're all working on a national project that's called Animal Agriculture and Climate Change. It is a national um, USDA NEFA funded project and we're just at the, the end of the project. So over the past six years we've created a really great collection of a lot of different extension materials um, that are specific to the um, appropriate animal agriculture species in each region and the impacts um, that those animal species realize from climate change. So visit our website, check out our resources, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll find some helpful resources there. <clears throat> so why use scenario planning? Um, this is a really great tool that can be used when you're in a situation where you need to think about change, uh, prepare for the future, cope with uncertainty or to stimulate creativity um, as opposed to the normal sort of prediction linear forecasting models where you arrive at one result. this is more of a brainstorming and thinking process just very generally scenario planning is a process that is designed for managing futures characterized by rapid directional change and complex uncertainties so you can see in the left box, um, typically what a, a common practice is, is to use something like forecast planning or predicting prediction models. So starting with a base of hard facts that we know today currently, and basically arriving at one future with a varying degree of those facts. Is it less precipitation or more precipitation in that one future? However, scenario planning allows us to start with a base of hard facts that we know today but to take into account uncertainties in the process. And taking into account those uncertainties allows us to arrive at multiple different stories to explain different futures. So doing this exercise proactively is essentially rehearsing for multiple different futures that are possible. And what this does is really strengthen an organization's ability to recognize, adapt to, and to take advantage of changes over time. A couple other brief points about the scenario planning process. It's a collaborative process that involves the participation of many stakeholders and experts. It's guided by the needs and the concerns of the appropriate organization or industry. It synthesizes information, in this case, from climate change projections and explores the potential implications. It helps the participants in the process to understand the different levels of uncertainty that are involved. So what you're basically ending up with is divergent scenarios. So when you choose the drivers, they could be political, ecological, physical, economic, or other you're going to end up with factors that are divergent. So you're going to be looking at the two extremes of a specific driver. So if you choose precipitation, you're going to be seeing what happens with very low precipitation, what happens with very high precipitation. <clears throat> the process is intended to equally consider low probability, which may mean high consequence, or inversely high probability, which could either mean low or high consequence scenarios. So for example, there may be a prediction that the incidence of strong hurricanes might increase. It could be um, something that could happen in the future. That could be a low probability, but if it were to happen, it would be a very high consequence. So basically, when you gather this group of people, stakeholders and experts, it's their job to weigh is this more important to look at because of the high consequence or is the higher probability thing of, for example, for us, temperature in New York State, it's almost certain to happen. And is that high consequence, high probability event stronger to prepare for or the lower probability event? So it's totally different than a forecasting model because probability doesn't have anything to do with the final outcome. 
I thought it would be help, helpful for everybody just to look at a few examples of completed scenarios. And I'm going to go pretty quickly through these because really Crystal is going to do a great job going slowly and really detailed through her completed scenario. Um, but these are for other unrelated to agriculture um, examples of scenarios that have been put together. <clears throat> so this is one that was put together for Lake Ontario. And they decided to look at population growth paired with precipitation. So you can see each quadrant has, for example, dry and slow, wet and slow, wet and fast, or dry and fast. So what they do is basically combine these two variables and look at the extremes, the divergent ends of each of those um, drivers. So if you have dry, so less population with slow population, excuse me, precipitation with slow population growth, what does that mean for this community, for this lake ecological system and the people that live around it? So each picture here visually represents um, what, the out, out, what the resulting scenario of that um, specific quadrant is supposed to be. Just another example, and I really like this one because the arrows and all the qualitative information really helps to see what's going on here. So in this case, um, this was from a national park that looked at the impacts of temperature, temperature increase paired with forest complexity, so more or less vegetation. Um, so if we take the top right quadrant here, that pairs temperature increase with um, higher forest complexity. So what happens in that situation? So for the particular uh, species that they decided to look at, they say a large temperature increase results in a higher growing season um, with higher forest complexity. That means more vegetation available to eat. This leads to an increase in population, for example, for the, for the deer population that live there. Um, shorter winters allow for more pests, in this case, tick populations, and that results to moose population decline. Um, and then you can see that each of the other quadrants does exactly the same thing. It pairs those drivers at divergent ends and looks at the impacts. So the scenario planning process basically has five steps, at least the, the way that we've gone about it. Um, it's sort of split into five phases. So the first phase is called orientation. That's where you really establish the project. Um, what are you looking at? What is the problem that you need to solve? What is your situation? Uh, what are the questions that you have that you want to come up with solutions for? Developing a purpose statement and really editing it many times and drafting it and having the input of other people helps to have a really clear vision of what you're looking at. What are the strategic challenges? And then also at this point, who's involved? Who's affected? who knows the most about it, who in your region can help you to um, determine the impacts uh, to the appropriate um, industry. Phase two is exploration. So the critical forces and the potential impacts. What is going to impact this situation that you're looking at? Um, what are the drivers that have an impact on that uh, organization? They could be for social forces, political forces, ecological, economic, environmental, or other. Um, and what I also really liked to do, um, and I think is, is a good way to, to go about it, is to have the outside in view. So start with the biggest view that makes sense for your situation and your question or issue that you're looking at. So I started with worldwide, what could impact um, the question that we're looking at? And then nationally, what could impact it? And then regionally, statewide, countywide, and then on your specific farmstead, what could impact it? So you get really all the forces that are potentially impacting your specific situation involved in the process to consider. Phase three is synthesis. And that's where you actually create the scenarios. Um, so you gather the people that you have um, come up with that are involved in the process and impacted by the process and know a lot about different variables that are involved. You get them together and basically hold one or several workshops where their job of the participants is to choose the drivers. Um, so from that huge list of forces that you've come up with, you need to narrow it down to two or three. And um, you can go through this process as many times as necessary to come up with the final scenarios. Um, this is just a draft of what was you know, done at our workshop that we came up with here to create the final scenario. Phase four is application. So once you have those scenarios, you want to apply them to whatever resources are important to you. So is it an animal species? Is it a vegetation species? Um, the chart here shows in this specific scenario, 
that they chose a few animal species and a few um, vegetation um, forest varieties um, and, and to determine the impacts to those um, different resources. Lastly is monitoring. So you've started with a base of predictions and over time, really what you can do is see how those predictions pan out. Are they holding true? Have they changed? Did something different come up that's more important at this point that you didn't know when you did the original process? So this is a, this is a continual process that can always be changed and adapted to what's happening currently and what, um, what is actually being taking place um, with the predictions that you started using. So I just thought I'd share really, really quickly. And like I said, Crystal is going to go through these really in depth. So um, I'm not going to share specific information. So for New York, um, our final two scenarios, I thought I'd show some pictures just because we have them available and they're really nifty. So we split the scenarios into a winter scenario grouping and then a growing scenario grouping just because the weather at those two different varying extremes really has so many different impacts it was easier to look at it um, in two separate groups. Um, so this, these are the winter scenarios and we decided to look at temperature and precipitation, but precipitation specifically in the increase in the frequency and the intensity of extreme storms and the impact that has on the farmstead. So not just increase in precipitation in general. Um, so in the winter, you can see that the impacts um, deal with the snow and rain, and then the temperature also has an impact on that as well. <clears throat> um, this is the growing season scenario version, and some same drivers, same divergent ends here. So looks at you know more more heavy storms, less heavy storms, and then temperature pulled into that as well. The impacts on crops, the cows, um, the farmstead in general, manure management etc. So if you'd like to know more about this and hear a little bit more than 30 second spiel on our, on our scenarios that we came up with for New York, then um, we are going to have a much more comprehensive presentation at Waste to Worth. So you can either contact me or listen to our talk at Waste to Worth.